We will continue with chapter 11 with lecture number 3. And now what we want to do is we've looked at policy, monetary policy and fiscal policy in isolation with one another. What happens when we put them together? Um, because very rarely are we going to see monetary policy done in a vacuum where there's no fiscal policy going on. And usually when there's fiscal policy going on, there's, well, some monetary policy going on to try to fix the mess ups of the fiscal policy. Uh, but, you know, there's, there's, there's these two things that are going to interact in the real world, and we have to figure out, well, how do we sort all this stuff out? Okay, so model. In our model, we have monetary and fiscal policy variables. What are those? We've talked about this. The monetary policy variable is M, the money stock. The fiscal policy variables are G, government spending, and T, taxes. Okay. In the real world, monetary policy makers may adjust the money supply in responses to fiscal policy and vice versa. They may accommodate fiscal policy. Well, they may actually try to um, counteract fiscal policy, depending on what's going on in the economy at the time. You could see the opposite happen as well. All right, so if we have this kind of interaction, then, well, the original thought on what's going to happen when we do such and such may not actually happen, right? Because if I both increase the money supply and increase government spending at the same time, what happens? Well, I don't know. Uh, maybe I just end up in the long run with higher prices. If I increase governments or increase taxes and increase the money supply, well, maybe those two offset. I don't know. We we need this ISLM model to help us sort out the different effects, break it down one by one, and then see what the overall net effect is. So, let's start out with a little um, scenario. Suppose Congress increases government spending. There are three possible um, responses on the Fed's part. They could hold the money supply constant, just do nothing. Two, they could keep interest rates constant. Or three, they could, increase, they could keep income constant. All right, so we're going to do one of those three, let's say. So in each case, the effects of this government spending change are different. So let's see what happens. So first, if Congress raises G, the IS curve, of course, shifts to the right. We've seen that in the previous lecture. Okay, we know that fiscal policy changes are modeled by shifts in the IS curve. All right, if the Fed holds the monetary policy constant, what happens? Well, we see exactly what we saw in the previous lecture. We just increase to a higher level of um, output at a higher interest rate, but not quite at the 1 over 1 minus MPC times delta G that the Keynesian cross predicts. Why? Because, well, we had an increase in interest rate, which also lowers investment. All right, let's look at it again. What happens if the Fed decides, I'm going to hold the real interest rate constant? Well, we have an increase in the IS curve from the raise in G, right? Government spending goes up, and so the IS curve shifts to the right. But the Fed decides, I want to keep interest rates from rising. And so what does it have to do? It has to accommodate that increase in the IS curve by increasing the money supply. So the Fed must increase the money supply. LM curve shifts to the right, or shifts down, whichever you prefer. And so what do we have? We end up with the actual change in um, real output or real income being equal to that predicted by the Keynesian cross. So the change, delta Y, ends up being 1 over uh, 1 minus MPC times delta G. Right? Why? Because interest rates stay the same, so we, have, we don't give anything back in terms of lower investment. Okay. Finally, what if the government decides to hold income constant? Or I'm sorry, if the Fed decides to hold uh, real output constant and says, hey, wait a minute. Nope, this isn't going to happen. We're at potential already at Y1. If we go to Y2, all we're going to do is cause inflation. So we got to keep, um, keep income from going beyond our potential. So it has to reduce the money supply. 
and it's going to reduce it such that we have no change in output but a fairly large change in the interest rate all right so an even larger change than what we would have seen if they'd have done nothing at all of course why because of course they're reducing the amount of money supply in circulation or the amount of money stock in circulation so three very different results happening from the question of how is the Federal Reserve going to respond to the increase in government spending. So estimates of fiscal policy multipliers. Okay, so we can look at um, first in this column here we're going to talk about the assumptions on monetary policy. So if the Fed holds the money supply constant and if the Fed holds nominal interest rates constant then an estimate of delta Y over delta G. So if it holds the money supply constant, actually what happens, we end up with a um, multiplier of less than one. So we don't increase. So income increases about 60 cents for every dollar that government spending increases. Um, if the Fed holds nominal interest rates constant, it increases by about two. So it's almost twice as much. So the multiplier is almost two. And we see that well, that makes sense. If we hold money supply constant, what happens? Well, um, we get a small increase. If we hold the interest rate constant, we get a big increase. All right. And we can do the same thing for taxes. Notice that they're smaller in both cases. All right. Why is that? Because the tax multiplier is smaller. Next. Let's think about an IS shock. What is an IS shock? It's an exogenous change in the demand for goods and services. So we can think of this, you can also think of this as an aggregate demand shock, um, but it's an exogenous change in demand for goods and services. So example, the stock market boom or crash changes the household's wealth, causing a change in consumption. A change in business or consumer confidence or expectations changes the amount of investment we want to do and or changes the amount of consumption we want to do. Right? Other things like uh, there, there's, there's various things. Anything outside the system that's going to change demand for goods and services, that's what we call an IS shock. LM shocks are exogenous changes in demand for money. So we can have uh, lots of things happen here. So an increase in identity theft might increase demand for money. Why would that be? Well, if I have higher identity theft, then I want to use credit cards and debit cards and, and these higher or you know, different technologies of money much less. I want to use cash. And so I want to hold more cash. And so I incre that increases my demand for, com for money. All right. Money demand might fall as people manage their financial accounts online. So if I am more comfortable with my financial account being online, well then maybe what I do is I have maybe a few hundred dollars in my checking account, which is pretty liquid, and I'll have um, the rest of my money in, say, a money market account, which isn't very liquid. So I can only transfer money out of my money market account so many times in a year say six times in a year without incurring fees. So it's not very liquid. But, well, hey, I can just transfer enough out, say, once every two months to make my checking account where I want it. But at the same time, I earn much more interest in my uh, uh, money market account. And so it saves the expense of holding money. It makes holding money less expensive for me to do that. But that also is reducing my demand for holding what, for what now we'll call pure money. Or if you rather, and, and I think this actually is more intuitive, holding liquidity. So we need to talk just a little bit about how the Fed works. All right, we're getting a little, a little astray of the um, ISLM model, but this is important stuff to know. Um, so news media commonly reports change, uh, Fed's policy as a change in interest rates. Um, mostly as if the Fed has direct control over these market interest rates. And that, that, that isn't how it works at all, actually. So what the Fed does is it has uh, several markets, but traditionally 
what happened was it had something called the federal funds rate. And so there's the federal funds market, and the federal funds market is where banks who are members of the Federal Reserve System loan each other money. All right, so banks loan each other money all the time. So uh, bank number one calls up bank number two and says, yeah, I need $50 million for 24 hours. Bank number two says, oh, yeah, sure, here you go. How much are you going to charge me? I'll charge you the Fed funds rate. Then bank number two calls up bank number one the, 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 you know, three days later and says, bank number one, I need $50 million. Can you, can you lend that to me? The bank number one says, oh, yeah, sure, sure, no problem. We've got a little extra. Uh, little extra reserves here, here you go. What you can charge me, charge you the Fed funds rate. And so it's this inner bank rate, all right? It's oftentimes called an overnight rate or an inner bank rate. Um, in the United States, we just call it the federal funds rate because we call it the federal funds market. Um, and the Fed actually interacts in that market. So it acts like a, well, say a almost a monopolist but not it's not a monopolist because there's not a monopoly there's lots and lots of firms in there but there's one huge honking great big gigantic federal reserve who can just simply start buying reserves right so actually borrow money from banks until the federal funds rate is increases to its target or could start lending reserves and just lend 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 right until the federal funds rate lowers um, to its target. And so it's those interactions within that federal funds market is how the Fed has traditionally done monetary policy. Now, in the, in the post-financial crisis era, the Fed has done policy much more differently, and it's, it's just a lot more complicated. So I'm not going to go into that in a lot of detail here. For that, I'd take a class like Money and Banking, where we will talk about that tons and tons. But for now, we're just going to assume kind of the traditional methodologies that happened, say, pre-2007, um, where the Fed's targeting a federal funds rate. All right, so the Fed actually will change money supply to achieve its target, and it's actually a really interesting process. I talk all about it in Money and Banking. I don't want to go into it here, but essentially, they either buy reserves or sell reserves. All right, they either borrow money from banks or lend money to banks in order to get the federal funds rate to to the whatever target it has set for it. Okay? So, basically, we look at interest rates, they all tend to follow one another. And so the idea behind controlling a short-term interest rate is that one other short-term interest rates are going to move with the federal funds rate. And then there's some term structure of interest rates, and I know I'm using a term that's you're probably not familiar with, but that doesn't matter. You have to have some kind of assumption over term structure of interest rates, which again, we'll talk in money and banking about much, much more, uh, that relates these short-term interest rates to longer-term interest rates. So, Here's the question. Why does the Fed um, target an interest rate instead of a money supply? Well, I'm going to answer that question in two ways. The first way is the way the textbook gives you, and then I'm going to give you my answer because I, um, I and my research tends to um, suggest that um, there's other ways, there's a better way to do this. Um, one, interest rates are easier to measure than the money supply. Okay, well, actually that's just wrong. Uh, sorry, that's not. Um, uh, interest rates are visible in a market, but the volume of trade within that market is also visible. Each of them are equally um, equally measurable. Now, we do have, we are still limited in our technology and in, in our knowledge of how to make proper aggregates and how to make proper measurements, but that's true for all of our macroeconomic data. So, Number one is, well, technically, I guess, slightly true, but basically, it's not enough to make a difference. We can measure the money supply. Um, we just have to do it properly. Two, the Fed might believe that LM shocks are more prevalent than IS shocks. If so, then targeting an interest rate stabilizes income better than targeting the money supply. Well, that might be so, but... The, there's some issues with targeting interest rates that are not being brought up here. The first one is one that we found 
to be an extremely important issue post financial crisis and that is the um, nominal interest rate has a lower bound of zero and so we've seen the federal funds rate hit that lower bound of zero it's basically zero right now it's um, very 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 low it's as low as it possibly can be set by the Federal Reserve so um, it's essentially the federal funds rate now is useless as an indicator of monetary policy and the Fed has been working with trying to increase or decrease liquidity number two this is a little bit of a misnomer in that the Fed actually does target a level of liquidity a level of um, reserves that are in circulation in order to achieve a particular interest rate target so in some sense we're kinda of getting at the same thing uh, so and, and finally the interest rate while it's the Fed funds rate I think is very good at least pre 2007 at um, as a signal of what the Fed intends to do with monetary policy it doesn't take into account two issues the first issue is that the Fed is not the only player in the creation of money All right, so when we create liquidity the whole financial system is involved and the Fed is one player in that process number two or the next thing that that's that's important to know is that there are there do exist non-policy liquidity um, shocks or non-policy related shifts in the LM curve and uh, Fed funds rate won't necessarily pick that up but again the textbook gives you these answers the other the other part is really what my opinion and my um, research has led me to believe